it's great to see after a bit of a hiatus for a number of reasons that the Melbourne International Animation Festival is back. And it's certainly back from the 7th to the 14th of May, uh, as well as a masterclass on the 5th of May. And it's my great pleasure to again be talking to the director of the Melbourne International Film Festival, Malcolm Turner. Malcolm, welcome to Movie Metropolis. Well, yeah, hi, Peter. Good to see you again. Long time no see, actually. It has been a bit of a while, hasn't it? So it's been a while. It's been yeah, you know, it's been a bit of a while for many of us, I think. I understand. And so finally, you've you've been able to secure funding and the wherewithal to be able to showcase. Oh, no, 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 the, no, the, no, no the funding. funding's gone. But no, no funding. Um, so the funding's gone. The you know a lot of the stuff that surrounded the kind of skeleton of putting on a festival like MEAF is gone. I haven't been able to travel for two or three years, and that's pretty much imperative to being able to do that. So, you know, like 20 years of building up, um, you know, an international network, if you like, has been kind of completely destroyed. But, you know, uh, the decisions that were made, and that's, you know, these are the consequences of it. So uh -huh. that's what it is. That's what it is. However, you've still been able to put together quite an extensive program. I notice over 140 animations and uh, 20 curated sessions. Tell me about sourcing all of those. Yeah, well, I mean, they, they, they come, I mean, this this version of me is quite a bit smaller than um, me as being sort of pre-COVID. So in many ways, we're trying to stand it back up and trying, you know, trying to kind of start slowly. Um, but, you know, that that being said, the, the, the model is basically still the same. So about half of it, give or take, uh, uh, the international competition programs, and they're essentially just um, collections of films that are drawn from the submissions. And then the other half are programs that are themed in some way. You know, sometimes they're older historical programs other times the new films that just sort of hit a specific or a certain theme that kind of stuff um and you know of course again you know because I, as i mentioned before i've been able to travel like it's it's hit submissions really really heavily so we used to get about three and a half to four thousand submissions we're down to about a solid third of that now so it's been a real scramble to make sure that we're or that i you know i'm across enough of the material to be able to put together um the competition programs and i think we're there you know there's there's in many ways like doing having done this for 25 years i kind of know a lot of the the trees to shake if, if i can put it in those terms um so going through all of that is one thing the this the special programs or you know the 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 other than the main competition programs a couple of them were ones that were either in the works or have kind of been adapted from programs that we'd put together pre-COVID. So the, the MOM school one is an example of that, but there, there aren't very, there aren't as many of the, of the, of the, you know, the particularly specialist programs in there because I haven't had a chance to be able to get overseas and put them together. And they can take a couple of years to put together. There are a few in the works that were ready to go back in 20, 21 um and i purposely and that, that sort of timeless program so looking at the old pannonia studio stuff that kind of timeless programs but i want to wait until we're kind of back up to full speed and have the potential at least to be able to get um relevant guests over for that um i suppose the other thing that i would say is that um the 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 australian contingent is as strong as it's always been you know so we've been able to you know really kind of touch base with a lot of australian filmmakers and we've got really 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 solid collection of australian films um so that aspect of me is definitely kind of at, at full power and full speed Okay, you're just breaking up a bit, uh, Malcolm. So, <laughs> uh, not sure what's what's going on there, but uh, I think we can continue. Uh, okay, so speaking of Australian showcase, uh, I mean, uh, it's great that you're featuring uh, the films of Denis Tupikov. Uh, sure. Yeah, you're still breaking up um, um and it, it helps that he's a really really lovely guy um 
he just finished um, his latest film, like right on deadline, um, sent it to me directly. Yep. Am I there? Yeah, yeah, you're yeah, still uh, not coming through that well, but keep going. I I have very little. I I don't I don't live in I don't live in Melbourne, so I have very very little internet. It's pretty patchy uh... out here. Um, Okay. It usually works though. Like I do all my university stuff on this. I've been on it all day and I was on it all last night. So maybe it's the recording function or something. I don't know. Yeah, it's saying that your bandwidth is very low. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it probably is. I, I, you know, I live in regional Victoria. So it's maybe. How am I doing? I might move the, I can move the thing around just one minute. Sure. Ah, the joys of the internet oh. and uh, technology. <laughs> okay. That may improve things. Okay. So you, you I, I think you're talking about Dennis Tupikov. Yeah, Dennis Tupikov. So, you know, an Australian animation icon and in many ways the person that's taken Australian animation out into the the big wide world for a very very long time um i think you know i mean I'll, I'll probably in some ways adam elliott would be a more of a household name amongst australian animators but overseas you know certainly overseas people know adam for sure but um dennis is is the 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 person that often comes to mind when you talk to you know my colleagues and you know other people in the animation world overseas so his latest film he finished right on submission on the submission date, like just within hours, I think of, of the, the end of submissions and sent it to me. And I, I really loved it. And I just thought, right, you know, a, a new Dennis Tupikoff film is something needs to be celebrated. So that's, uh, we're, we're opening the Australian showcase with that. And, um, Dennis is going to be doing a, um, uh, the next day is going to be doing a, a sit down, um, with us and doing a kind of a, like a meet the filmmaker Q and A. So he'll be talking about the making of that and, um, taking us through that process and and um, also answering questions from the from the audience if they have any. Yeah, terrific! Uh, very pleased to see that. And I notice you've got a special showcase of films John Astley and Emily Burridge. I'm not familiar with them. Yeah, so what we what we have like what we've been able to do, and in in looking for silver linings in all of this, you know, looking for a smaller venue and a venue that would that is kind of more suited f to do the 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 little stuff and doing the talks and things like that um that we just haven't really been able to do in the last few years. Um, the 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 place that all that stuff's happening at is the backlot studio over in yep. South Melbourne. And it's just absolutely perfect for that. Yep. So we have a meet the filmmakers session every weekday of the festival mm. so each each day there's a different filmmaker or in some cases filmmakers um who we're going to sit down with and it's just an opportunity to kind of take a look at the the the, the creating and the making and the production of animation from a whole bunch of different angles um with people that actually make it you know rather than just have my grizzled visage turn up at the front of the platform every screening and just go hey all these films from france and estonia are fantastic enjoy them you know we can actually get some real animators and the people who make this stuff and and hear about how they how they're going so john astley um <laughs> how can i put it politely he's taken a very long time to make this particular film and it's a, it's a film that i i love now but will love when it's actually finished but it's been in the making for um two and a half odd years and it's you know and that's about one and a half years longer than it probably really should have been and john will <laughs> tell you this as well um and it's it's just this it's an interesting kind of case study in how you know taking a script from a relatively orthodox kind of live action style film script and then trying to adapt it into something that would be a great animation, a film that uses the unique properties of animation. It's a really good case study in that. And I, you know, full disclosure, he's one of my students and, and I was, you know, I spent quite a bit of time with he and Emily, who was his producer at the time, um, you know, trying to 
kind of get the animation into that film. And one of the one of the things I love about John, John's a great writer. He was um I had him in his first year, I had him in my first year class, and he was he just knocked all the writing assignments out of the out of the window. And you don't strike that very often these days in the university environments. Like people have forgotten how to write. But um he's great at it. And I knew the script would be good. It just he just needed that kind of kick along. He needed that I suppose that encouragement to create the non-prose, non-orthodox, fully animation styled script, and so it's, it's been this it's been this really interesting journey. And I've, I said to him quite some time ago, if you can get a work in progress version of this up, we'll turn it into a, a kind of a meet the filmmaker session. And he's determined to have the film itself finished by July third because it's his birthday, and we have a bet on he's, he's going to show it in the back lot um on july 3rd if it's ready i'm going to pay for the booking and if it's not ready he's paying for it um but it will be i've seen i've seen some updates and it's going along quite nicely but there's some beautiful 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 animation in there i mean the, the stuff that's held is it's all about you know this kind of incredible forest environment that was the you know that was the skeleton that was the the backbone of the film and the backbone of the idea and that stuff has has really really held and it just it looks great and the the marvelous thing about john is he's one of these rare one of these rare creatures that you find in the university environment these days who actually wants to make wants to spend his life making short animated films and um you know, you don't have to know me very well to know that I'll crawl over broken glass to support anybody that wants to spend their life doing that. Absolutely excellent to hear all that. I noticed you're featuring some films from Hungary. Yep. So, uh, yeah, Hungary. So um, this is part of a much bigger project that I hope will be um, a more prominent part of the, the festival next year. So um, back in... I want to say 2019, I'm pretty sure, but it might have been 18, I'm not pretty sure it's 19. Um, I go to a festival, I used to go to a festival every year called Animatica in Ljubljana, which is one of my favourite places to just be. And Animatica is a sensational festival. And they showed um, about five or six programmes of Hungarian animation there. And I'd seen quite a bit of Hungarian animation over the years, and I certainly knew about Pannonia Studio. But but it, it just really sharpened my interest in Pannonia. And I got a little bit of a research grant, went and spent a, a month in Budapest and went through their archive. They made about... Uh, they made about 800 films. The Pannonia Studio made about 800 films um, back in the day. They were the communist era animation studio. And they've, they've kept about 650 or 700 of them. So I went through all of those. But at the same time, I was able to spend, because I was, you know, I had that block of time in, in Budapest, I was able to spend some time kind of looking at a couple of the schools there. And the main one is the MOM school, M-O-M-E. And it stands for something in Hungarian that I'm not even going to try and pronounce, but um, MOM will cover it. And it, I mean, it's been going for quite a long time, but they've, they've recently, I don't know, the last five or six years, they've um, built a lot of new facilities and they've blended that school with the School of Architecture and they're producing some really interesting stuff. So I'd, I'd spent a little bit of time in MoMA and I was lucky enough to get an opportunity to do a little bit of teaching there since I was there and came away with, I went to their graduation ceremony that year and that was quite an experience. I mean, you know, you're talking about, I mean, it was, it was like a rock concert, you know, had, everybody had merch and there was sirens going off and all the rest of it. People came from all over Europe for it. It was fantastic. I thought, right, what we're going to do is a couple of programs of Pannonia films and we'll do a showcase of, of MOM films because typically MIAF does, we pick one of the programs we always do is we pick a school from somewhere and kind of showcase what they're doing. So the Pannonia programs, they are sitting there waiting for the moment when I can bring somebody out from Hungary to actually, you know, help me introduce them. But the the MOM program, I thought, look, you know, they produce a graduation reel every year. The, the grad reel they produced last year was just fantastic, really, really good. I mean, every single one of them could have gone into that program. So I sat down and kind of pulled out the the not the ones I liked the best, but the the ones that I thought, you know, had the greatest kind of spread of styles and, you know, kind of really showcase the, you know, some of the things that they they do particularly well. And, you know, there you have it. That's that program. And it's, it's, I, I, it's like, I, I'm used to it, but I think a lot of people will be surprised at the, the kind of energy and the um, surrealness, if you like, of a lot of the, the narratives of those films and the, the kind of really out there visuality 
of those films are not something I think a lot of people kind of typically associate with Hungary for whatever reason. I don't know why, but or, or maybe they do. I don't know, but but it's it's astonishing work. It's really 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 good. So and the sound is really good too because they got a brand new sound studio and they they spent quite a bit of money investing in people who could operate that that um, sound studio properly. So the you know for for um, graduate films, the sound is particularly good. They're all five point one. Um, soundtracks and all the rest of it so it's gonna be good sounds terrific now i notice uh animal logic is uh in the credits of a number of films in terms of special effects and animations and so on and i notice you're doing a showcase uh uts animal logic academy uh and q a with that yeah um, well um yeah kind of so what that's about is i mean the the animal logic is the big I mean, I'm sure if people haven't heard of it, they've heard of their work. I mean, Animal Logic's a massive, massive um, 3D commercial studio, and they, they've done any number of things. I mean, the Lego movies, for example, they do all the animation yeah. on the Lego movies, but, they, you know, they do big, big stuff. Um, and Animal Logic have, have um, joined together with UTS or the University of Technology, Sydney, who have an excellent um, animation course, and formed what's called the animal logic the uts animal logic lab and essentially um it's it's a kind of meeting of minds in a certain sense so animal logic bring their expertise they and they bring their their contacts in terms of you know all the professionals that work and go through a place like animal logic and uts you know bring their experience as educators and um obviously their their capacity to attract top rate students and they've, they've created this lab and it's an amazing thing to walk in you come out you come out of the lift you go into this really really ordinary looking building it's not doesn't it's i mean it's in reasonable shape but it, you know you wouldn't be surprised to see the thing knocked down this weekend and turned into apartments that kind of thing but you go into this thing you go into a lift um and you come out of the lift and it's like a mission impossible moment you know it's it's the doors open and you're in this whole other world and it's like you've been transported not up four or five flights but you've been transported somewhere else all together you walk into i don't know 100 computer stations that are all lined up according to you know different types of the animation production process amazing meeting rooms and you know viewing theaters and all the rest of it and you know wandering around that place uh you know some of the clueiest animation educators particularly 3d um, animation animation educators in the in the country and they they join with animal logic they go through a process um, of selecting students to take part in that they then go through a process of selecting storylines and designing characters and and then they knuckle down and they make these films and they they turn out I don't know. They turn out several films a year anyway. And and it's occurred to me, like we've shown a good number of them over the years, and it's occurred to me at a certain point that there's enough films in there for a really good program. So I um threw myself on the tender mercies of the you know, Animal Logic and the and UTS and they agreed to fly down the the head of the the lab a guy, lovely guy called Ian Thompson. And um he helped me put together the he helped me get the the you know permission to screen a bunch of these films. So we're going to show some of the films, but um sort of at least half of the point is to you know have that conversation with ian thompson and learn about how that lab was set up and how they go about doing what they're doing and what it's like for you know what is essentially a school environment to work with you know one of the most accomplished um 3d digital animation um studios literally in the world mm, terrific uh, again, mm. excellent stuff. Um, I noticed something called Making of Among the People. What's that? Yeah, Jody Cleaver. Jody Cleaver. Um, so Jody, I've known Jody for quite a long time. Jody studied VCA back in the day, I think. Um as um a really accomplished, really imaginative abstract animator, you know, when she when she sets her mind to it. She doesn't do a lot of animation. I mean, she's a, sort of a multi media artist in a lot of ways. But um, her, her her new film Among the People turned up in turned up for last year's festival anyway, and I loved it straight out of the box. I thought this is great, and I put it in the abstract program 
So a film, a film like that, an Australian abstract film could go in the Australian showcase or it could go in the abstract showcase. And for whatever reason, I decided to put it in the abstract showcase. I just thought it would kind of fit in there quite nicely. And when we came to do, and this is, on, this is entirely on me, when we came to do International Animation Day at Treasury last year, I simply pulled up the Australian showcase and that's what we showed. And of course, forgot about Jody's film, you know, over in the abstract showcase. I was like, oh, no. And it was kind of too late to change anything by the time International Animation Day came around. So I thought, well, you know, I'm head of the Silver Linings Department here at MEFHQ. I thought, well, let's pull that film out. And we are going to show it in the Australian showcase this year. But there's such a great story behind it. And it's it's a kind of animation that we don't produce a lot of in Australia. And when we do produce it, it's often you know it's it's it kind of a lot of us a lot of abstract australian animation kind of lacks confidence to really sort of go the whole abstract and kind of have that you know have its beating heart come from the world and the aesthetics of abstract animation and jody's fearless in that way like that's never a concern with any of her films but there's there's a really wonderful story that 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 sits behind it essentially um jody fell in love with the music of a, a street performer by the name of um natalie trailing who played classical music on a portable piano out on the street for years and years and years and years and years and Jody's really loved the music and I I'm not a musicologist um Jody kind of is she's you know close to it in a certain sense like to sit around and listen listen to her talk about or to break down the kind of way that Natalie plays piano started making sense to me and I just thought you know what this needs a lot more explanation than just bunging the film up on the screen and showing it so I thought right I Good excuse to get um, Jody in out of the cold. It's an opportunity for me to um, kind of make up for forgetting to put her film in International Animation Day screening last year, which is exactly what I did. Um, but it's also a good opportunity to kind of really, you know, do, do that thing that festivals do when they get it right, which is to, you know, take a good, hard, solid, clear-minded look at the artistic process, you know, the stuff that sits at the, the heart of some of these films. Because if you go to a festival like MIAF or any, I mean, any film festival really, but particularly a short film festival, you know, it's film and then it's a film and then it's a film and then it's a film. And, you know, you can sit there and you can concentrate and you can do your best to take all this stuff in, but there's only so much you're going to get from watching each one of those films. And it's just, you unless you get a chance to talk to the filmmaker and unless you get a chance to hear them speak about how they made it the kind of decisions they made you know a lot of that stuff is just going to go past you because it, it just does and and i and and you know the whole thing was made a little bit more poignant by the fact that natalie actually passed away just very recently about two or three months ago um so it, it has that kind of dimension to it as well but to 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 listen to um jody talk about and to break down the music and the way that she does and then to kind of understand how she's turned that into the basis for the visuality of her film i just think is captivating i, mean, I think that's that's going to be a, a great session so i'm really looking forward to doing that and i'm i'm doing that one myself i wouldn't miss um, moderating that particular session for all the tea in china okay great stuff and i noticed uh, uh some other uh, filmmakers are uh, showcased matt bissett johnson and felix yeah. colgrave yeah well <laughs> there you go so there, there's two good programs for a friday night you know there's <laughs> there's um uh, you know so, so, some things work some things are made for Friday night. You know what I'm saying, Peter? Some things are just made for Friday night, and both of those programs are. So originally, like Felix, Felix has been making films for quite some time and and and, and quite well known, I think, you know, within the realms of, you know, how any, you know, as far as any local animator is going to be known. But he makes these very, very quirky, very surreal kind of, you know, somewhat psychedelic films with these bizarre characters and things like that in it. And... um we like I'd wanted to kind of have him just do a single kind of filmmaker's session earlier in the week regarding his new film. But in actual fact, he and his wife Zoe both um, had films accepted for a festival in Berlin. So they're going to be away the week beforehand and they're not getting back in Australia until kind of the Monday. So I'm like, you know what, like, let's kick the chocks out from under this and let's do a whole program of, of Felix's films and do them on a Friday night. And in terms of Matt, Matt, <laughs> Matt, Matt, 
man has been sending me films man i don't know how old he was when he first started making films but he he started sending me these things that looked like they'd been animated and they didn't look like they were animated on post-it notes with you know felt tip pens and points for trying you know the first ones that come in points for trying no question about it but probably not something that was going to be screened and you know he sent them but he didn't give up like he kept sending these things in year after year and i thought one year i just you know what it's time it's time these films that matt's doing they're getting better and wetter and he's kind of locking into a style and these characters are just absolutely brilliant so let's put one of these things in late night bizarre and the audience loved it and there was just kind of no going back and now he seems to be he's kind of up the technical standard of these just a little bit just enough to kind of make them a little bit more polished um but not to lose any of the kind of kind of crazy grunt that sits below them and again you know like he hasn't it's not a retrospective and you know all of his films are kind of two minutes long but i just thought you know it's time to bring matt in out of the cold um and and have him show a collection of these films and 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 also like i haven't i haven't quite finished the conversation with matt yet about exactly what we're going to show but i am kind of keen to maybe try and pull out one or two of those early ones that didn't make the cut you know and it's that's fine like there were reasons they didn't make the cut but but in a, an occasion like this on a friday night with maybe a drink in our hand and you know a program called you know matt finally comes in from the cold you know there's there's we, we can all spare a minute or two to just see where this stuff comes from and that that session i predict is going to be hilarious yeah. hilarious and matt, matt himself is quite a character so you know i'm looking forward to looking forward to doing that excellent excellent stuff and i notice on the the 5th of may you're doing a master class on virtual reality uh in um, at deakin university yeah not that's not so much us actually that's that's a kind of a partnership with deacon now they're they're going ahead in leaps and bounds with that and they've got some very very interesting um professional and commercial partnerships that are all kind of attached to that so essentially you know the, the driving force of that um i would say is uh leonor's torre um who lectures out in, in deacon and is pretty passionate about kind of taking the um virtual um production stuff to the next level and i think as best as i can tell deacon seem fairly committed to that as well mm -hmm. um so th they put together the, the that workshop um and said could this be part of me app and i was absolutely delighted to have it there we couldn't quite squeeze it into or fit it into you know in between the official dates but it's it's good enough now i, I personally don't know a great deal about that i think you know michael might have the mayor producer might have had a little bit more to do with those guys but every once in a while just a, a really good idea comes along and there's people that you can trust that are attached to that idea and there are people that know plenty about it and they should be just allowed to get on and put it together um so in in that sense it's it's something that's really been organized by Leonor's and probably some other people but you know it's it's sort of come out of that and you know absolutely delighted to have that that kind of stuff attached to me because we would not have been able to do you know any kind of workshop under our, our completely under our own auspices this year so it's it's super good that that's on board excellent stuff now I'm, I'm just wondering uh in terms of trends of animation um is it computer generated or hand-drawn uh, are, are there any sort of trends emerging or, or are they still both as diverse as one another as well oh, as stop, stop motion as well of course yeah look at trends come and trends go i don't know the films are getting longer and tell you that that's starting to annoy me um average length is sort of kind of creeping up over the years or at least the ones average lengths are the ones that are being you know accepted and sort of widely screened in festivals no look i don't think so i mean the, this notion that 3d animation is kind of taking over is nonsense um I, it's, people certainly use computers a lot more to, to do this stuff but so you know a lot of the stuff that i would call hand-drawn animation um yeah less and less and less of it's drawn onto to paper or cardboard although you'd be surprised how much is but you know a lot of it is being drawn onto tablets and things like that but that's you know that doesn't make a computer animation per se I, I wouldn't call that a trend. I would just say, you know, that's like you and I using email instead of writing letters, you know, just because I send a thousand emails a, a day doesn't 
make me a you know computer analyst or you know computer animator or anything like that it's just a tool to use mm. so i think um i think i think the 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 there's there's no i i've never really detected any long-term trends you get you get pockets of stuff pop up every year and you think oh that's interesting that seems to be a bit of a feature of things this year but it you know next year it's something else i mean there's quite a bit of black and white really good black and white work um this year and you know you could say that's a trend but i, I bet it won't be the case next year it wasn't the case last year um the there's a um you know there's a continuing kind of high reliance on wordless narrative but that's been a fairly common thing within the world of short animated film and you know it's something that surprises is not a trend at all but something that would surprise a lot of people is still the most popular kind of subgenre, if you like of animation that's being made and presented you know remains abstract animation it's still kind of a solid quarter of the stuff that comes in there's more of that made than kind of any other particularly identifiable um genre or subgenre of animation so way more so than kids um we you know there was there's very little kids animation around this year it's very difficult to um put together that in fact we don't have a kids animation program in MEF these days i i um sort of have a a, a kind of a collaborative relationship with um, richard suata over at st kilda and um we sort of joined together and put together a program of kids and family animation out of our our joint resources and, and run it over there we may get back to doing kids animation i i think but but you know there's it's really hard like you you it's the hardest program to put together there's the least of that amount of stuff around um you know there's still as much handmade like purely handmade animation around as there's been in recent years so you know making puppet animation making stop motion animation by definition that's handmade it always will be and some people are just drawn to doing that. I mean, you're probably aware that Adam Elliott's making a, a, a claymation feature film at the moment over in Docklands. You know, the stuff is still being still being made, and that's reflected in the world of um, short animated film. Yeah, and we, we had an Oscar-nominated stop-motion animation uh, uh, from a Queensland filmmaker who I spoke to, which... Lo uh, yeah, which yeah exactly. Good, good point. Yeah. Yeah, good point. I forgot about that. And, you know, lovely guy too. I had the opportunity to meet on that program. The program of um, animated shorts kind of went around the country and mm. whoever was organizing that, I never got to meet them. Um, and, 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 and they, they, they didn't pay my fee either, just record. Um, but I was happy to kind of go in one day and, and um, Lachlan was in Melbourne and um, went along and, um, you know, did a QA and a with him. Just the loveliest guy mm. in the world. I mean, I would be un bearable if i had a fraction of that talent and you know it was to some extent it was a lockdown film but you know I was, it's an 11 or 12 minute film mm. that he did more or less on his own yep hundreds of bits and pieces like all sorts of different facial expressions mm. sensational story really top flight like a grade level yes. of animation perfect timing really good soundtrack you know like i'm not not, not surprised it was nominated for an oscar um and um and, and and it was way better than the film that won the bloody Oscar. You know, to be honest, I agree in with my you. opinion. <laughs> no, I just just rec just record that, and I'm not even being parochial. Like you know, if it, no, I I agree. It made I, I, anyway. I just thought yeah. it was a really good film. That's Absolutely all. right. So, Absolutely right. Yeah. Okay, my Zoom is is running out. So net now, let's talk about booking tickets. Seventh to the fourteenth of May at uh, Melbourne International Film Festival. Uh, uh, at uh, Treasury Theatre and the Backlot Studios. So let's talk about booking tickets and uh, how people can access all of these fine films. Yeah, so it's, it's actually the Melbourne International Animation Festival, but um, it and, could, uh, couldn't be easy. You just go, to, <laughs> just go to MIAF net. So M I A F dot net. Um, it's there. I mean, the the beauty of us going kind of more independent and using our own venues this year is we've been able to cut the cost of tickets way down. So like tickets are ten and twelve bucks. Um, all the passes and things are long sold out, but there's still I think you know a good number of session tickets for most of the stuff, and there's weekend passes and things like that. But if you go to MIAF M I A F dot net, um just work your way through that and it's super easy melbourne international animation festival i'll get it right Indeed. now mm. <laughs> from the 7th to the 14th of may a terrific showcase of animation and uh congratulations malcolm on being able to put it all together obviously with uh, uh lots of uh, uh difficulties and uh, and uh, uh -huh. issues <laughs> 
It is st- it is still coming together, Peter. It is still coming together. So to, to call it all put together is is um you know somewhat misleading, but we will get there on the day, you know, like the paint will still be wet, but um <laughs> <laughs> there'll be there'll be films on the screen and there'll be people talking and we've got bars in both venues that are open for the whole time even after all of the screening so there you go it'll be all right on the night as they say so oh, yes. yeah. <laughs> what, yeah what what could possibly go wrong eh? what could possibly go wrong <laughs> no in the animation world nothing <laughs> nothing yeah Malcolm Turner, the uh, director of the Melbourne International Animation Festival, uh, 7th to the 14th of May. And uh, as usual, Malcolm, thanks so much for talking with me. Absolutely. My pleasure. All the best. Bye-bye. All right. See you later. Bye-bye. Okay.